The next item of business is the debate on motion 4580 in the name of Tom Arthur on community wealth building, delivering transformation in Scotland's local and regional economies. I would be grateful if members who wish to speak in the debate were to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Tom Arthur to speak to and move the motion up to 13 minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to begin the first debate on community wealth building held in the Scottish Parliament. Last week I had the pleasure of meeting Ted Howard at an event hosted by the Economic Development Association Scotland in Edinburgh. Ted is the co-founder and president of the Democracy Collaborative, an economic think tank based in the United States. The Democracy Collaborative created the community wealth building approach, with much of the model's early application and learning in the city of Cleveland, Ohio. That city's challenge with the impact of deindustrialisation warranted radical and creative thinking. In developing community wealth building, a way was devised to harness the power of public spend and assets to grow new cooperative businesses and create new jobs. In turn, this helped to empower and revitalise people and communities. Let me be clear, community wealth building is not just for cities. It is an integrated approach to local and regional economic development suitable for implementation across Scotland. Scotland is at the forefront of advancing the model, with interest growing rapidly across the world. In fact, last week, Ted Howard said, and I quote, your country is fast becoming a global leader in the movement of community wealth building. I have noted its origins. I want to go on to set out how the model works and why the Scottish Government and a growing number of Scotland's local authorities and their partners have adopted it. Before I do that, it is worth reflecting that our new national strategy for economic transformation highlights Scotland's extraordinary economic potential. Crucially, NSET also recognises the challenges we face as a society. By setting out a decade-long plan to develop a well-being economy where prosperity and equality share equal billing. Be happy to. Willie Rennie. Um, I mean, I've sat in this chamber for what ten years now, and I've heard speeches like this being repeatedly delivered. And you know, I love as a liberal discussing all this kind of stuff. But <laughs> at, at some point, we need to deliver. And if you look back over the last fifteen years, the record's pretty woeful. Surely we should be discussing actually making things work rather than these lofty kind of debates. Minister. I suggest Willie Rennie buckles up and listens to the rest of the speech. We need to take a broader view of what a prosperous economy, society and country are, moving beyond traditional measures of growth and avoiding the pitfalls associated with reliance on trickle-down economic benefits reaching communities. Collectively and as consensually as possible, we all need to ensure that our economy functions to help businesses thrive, with the ultimate aim of enabling a society that puts people and the environment at the heart of its highest ambitions. Our 2021 programme for government commits the Scottish Government to introduction of a community wealth building bill during this session of Parliament. I want to work with colleagues from across the Chamber to ensure legislative change can help simplify the economic development landscape and enable community wealth building to advance. Certainly. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful uh, for, to the Minister for giving way, but, uh, and I am grateful for his commitment to these, but he would have to acknowledge that, despite the seven references in NSET to community wealth building, there is little there about what is actually meant uh, or the resources that will be applied. Will actually establishing meanings and uh, identifying resources be a core part of the work that he is discussing here? Minister. I am going to come on to some of that um, as my remarks progress. As the word spreads about community wealth building, some partners have expressed the view that Scotland is good at this sort of activity. Many successful programmes and initiatives in, for example, regeneration and procurement have enabled and continue to enable revitalisation of communities, creation of new jobs and land and property assets being placed in the hands of communities. Community wealth building is not intended as a replacement of, for current efforts to grow or regenerate our local and regional economies. What it is is a refinement of current practice that can, that can help the public, private, third and community sectors to act in concert on the economy of a place by taking a full system approach. Combine the resources of all anchor partners. I am sorry, I need to make some progress. What community wealth building can do is combine the resources of all anchor partners, be that project resources 
or mainstream budgets, and it can provide a joined-up and streamlined prism for jointly coordinating economic planning and delivery. The model represents a practical focus on economic development in real communities with potential to deliver a progressive wellbeing economy for Scotland, more and better fair work opportunities, business growth and the emergence of new cooperative and employee-owned models, more community-owned assets, more stable local populations enabled by new economic opportunities and shorter supply chains supporting net zero ambitions. The Scottish Government wants to use community wealth building as a means of rewiring how we foster local and regional economies. The model is a relatively new one, but it is not a rebranding of previous approaches or a high-level mission statement. Community wealth building is a new organising principle that is also a hard-headed, practical and operable economic development model. It relies on five pillars of activity. The first is spending. This is about how the public sector procures with the private and third sectors and uses its wider investment power. The workforce pillar is all about ensuring that conditions attached to current and future jobs adhere to what in Scotland is called fair work first principles. With the inclusive ownership pillar, the model seeks to grow employee-owned and cooperative businesses, offering employees a deep stake in the place that they work. With the land and property pillar, the objective here is to identify new opportunities for community ownership of assets, of at least a clear focus on providing local communities with a material economic benefit from the use of land. Finally, the model has a pillar focused on flows of finance or borrowing, with the emphasis on attracting more ethical lending to help local and regional businesses grow. I would like to turn now to some examples of progress made with the model. In doing that, I will embark on a whistle-stop tour from the North East United States via the North West of England before returning home to Scotland. In Cleveland, six anchor institutions, including Case Western University and the Cleveland Clinic, with the support of the city government, helped incubate a network of three employee-owned co cooperatives employing residents from low-income communities. These evergreen co-ops grow food, are engaged in community energy projects and provide laundry services to a range of anchor organisations. Employees benefit from a living wage and a profit share scheme. Inspired by what they have seen in the US, Preston in England took up the mantle, creating 1,600 additional jobs, an additional £70 million of net investment for the city economy by anchor institutions and £200 million for the regional economy. These examples have inspired local authorities and their partners in Scotland over the past few years to advance community wealth building. We are supporting the work of five pilot areas in Clackmannanshire, south of Scotland, Western Isles, Tay Cities, Fife and the Glasgow City region, all of which have developed and began implementing their community wealth building action plans. Our COVID recovery strategy commits the Scottish Government to working with all local authorities to develop action plans. Through the Ayrshire Growth Deal, we are investing £3 million in community wealth building to support businesses and communities across the region to enhance local supply chains, ensure fair work and maximise local assets. The region has benefited from North Ayrshire Council's trailblazing work as the first council in Scotland to adopt community wealth building. During a recent visit to the Western Isles, I spoke with people in the village of North Tolsta, who explained how the revenue from a community-owned wind turbine was being used to support a number of local jobs and important community organisations within the village. I met with the Glasgow City Region to hear about progress in vacant and derelict land and procurement practices, and I was heartened to hear how individual local authorities are driving community wealth building in their localities, as well as through a collaborative regional approach. By establishing a pipeline of planned construction work, the Glasgow City Region has been able to generate employment opportunities, including quality apprenticeships for local people. The South of Scotland Enterprise Agency recently updated me on their work with local registered social landlords to develop local supply chains for green retrofitting of housing stock. In meetings with Clackmannanshire Council and Fife Council, I have heard about rare respective work focusing on employability in developing supply chains, which will create more local employment opportunities. Finally, I recently attended a Community Land Scotland parliamentary reception, which highlighted the fantastic wonder work underway across Scotland to promote community ownership of land and the benefits that can be derived for local economies and communities. Uh, very briefly. Liz Smith. Can, can I thank the Minister for giving way? And he's quite right uh, about some of the really good things that are happening across some of the areas that he's just mentioned. Does he accept, however, that Audit Scotland has made some very strong points recently about the importance of the transparency of where that money is being spent 
and the extent of the delivery of these projects that have to be very clearly measured uh, so that the public can actually see what benefits have been uh, accruing to it. Minister. I, I take the point that Liz Smith makes. I think as well with community wealth building, our commitments around developing a wellbeing economy metrics is going to be important because this community wealth building is a model which can deliver on the aspirations and ideals of a wellbeing economy. I just wanted to touch as I move towards closing my remarks, presiding officer, on the work of the Scottish Land Commission, which has launched community wealth building guidance, setting out practical actions that public bodies can take to use and manage land productively and in the public interest. Our local authorities are driving the agenda, but we are also seeing different sectors and anchor public bodies look to embed this approach into their practice and engagement with local partners, including NHS Scotland, Police and Fire Service, as well as our further and higher education institutions. President officer, my proposition is that there is little to disagree with on this exciting new approach. It is basically about making our existing spend work harder to create fairer and more resilient local and regional economies. Community wealth building is about making all of the money work for local communities. The principles underpinning the model will increasingly influence the way in which the Scottish Government itself invests. Turning to the development of legislation, during my discussion with the pilot areas and other key stakeholders, a number of potential barriers and impediments to advancement of community wealth building have been discussed. I chaired the first meeting of a new community wealth building bill steering group earlier this month. A broad cross-section of public, private and third sector partners have been invited to help develop and refine our legislative proposition. I also want to work with colleagues in the Chamber and, where relevant, the UK Government in as consensual a way as possible to ensure the continued success of community wealth building. I am keen that development of the legislation is influenced by those with experience on the ground, building on that knowledge and enthusiasm. That extends to ensuring we measure progress. The model's operation results in outputs such as business growth, new job creation and more land and community ownership. We also need to focus on gathering evidence about the beneficial long-term impacts of community wealth building. Community wealth building can help transform local and regional economies across Scotland. It can protect and create good jobs. It can revive underutilised assets in our town centres and rural and island economies, unleashing the dynamism of community ownership and ensuring local communities have a greater stake in their local economy. As Ted Howard says, Scotland is becoming a global leader in this field, and we must be ambitious, bold and innovative in developing legislation to ensure that we realise this opportunity to unlock the potential of businesses and communities across Scotland, creating a stronger, fairer and greener economy. Uh, it was at an event recently, and I was struck with a, a quote that was uh, referenced, uh, I think the originator was um, Albert Einstein, and it was that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. In rethinking our economy over the next decade, I think community wealth building can make a pivotal contribution. Now, perhaps not as erudite as an Einstein quote, but I was informed recently that in a, an album released by the uh, American band R.E.M. one year after I was born, there was a song called Koya Hoga. The song's themes include repairing a damaged environment and the importance of community. The first line goes, let's put our heads together and start a new country up. I like the radical sentiment. The interesting connection is, is that the Cuyahoga River runs right through the centre of Cleveland, Ohio, the home of community wealth building. Creating Scotland's future economy needs all of us to be radical and creative, and I think that community wealth building has a key role to play in creating that future. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Douglas Lumsden to speak to and move amendment 4580.3 up to nine minutes. Please. Thank you, President Officer. And I start by moving the amendment in my name. Uh, this is a hugely important debate for communities right across Scotland. Community wealth building provides opportunity, opportunities for delivering a prosperous society for all our citizens. And I'm pleased to be opening on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives today reaffirming our support as a party and the ambitions that community wealth building seeks to achieve. Whilst these ambitions are laudable, the government must ensure that where public money is to be allocated, it represents value to the public purse and substantial outcomes for our people. 
President officer, the Scottish Conservative amendment before us today recognises the importance of community wealth building and seeks to ensure that constitutional differences are put aside and focus is given to working collaboratively, collaboratively with the UK Government to ensure our collective ambitions are realised for the whole of Scotland. I do find it strange, however, that this devolved government has brought this debate forward at this time. Yes, it is important, but this is only one part of our growing economy. And without a proper, coherent strategy in economic growth, then this debate, I am afraid, is not going to bring the changes uh, required. And when we look at the SNP's report card on the economy, it makes for some grim reading. We have Alex Salmond's green job promise of 28,000 jobs by 2020 failed miserably, another broken promise by this SNP Government, with much public money pumped into BIFAB, for example, with little or nothing to show for it, and communities have been failed. And we have the smelter at Lock Arbor, millions of pounds of taxpayers' cash put at risk, maybe illegally, thousands of jobs promised, but once again, very little to show for it. Once again, communities have been failed. And then we have the ferry fiasco, millions of pounds pumped in to purchase two ferries, with no guarantee, no design, no windows, no end date, no LPG storage and no proper procurement trail. And years late, once again, communities have been failed. And now we have the SNP's latest pet project, ScotRail. So when we discuss transforming local and regional economies, let's think about the damage being caused by having no transport system at certain times of the day. The rail dispute is causing havoc right across Scotland and having a huge impact on the events and hospitality industry just at the time that they are trying to recover from over two years of disruption. This will cause businesses to fail and jobs to be lost, and how will that help our local communities? The Scottish Hospitality Group have today called for an urgent review of the temporary timetable. And I say temporary, but nobody in the government can seem to define what temporary actually means. The group say that there is a threat to public safety as customers and staff struggle to get home at night. Presiding officer, there is little use in creating good, well-paid jobs if people can't get to those jobs because of poor or now dependent on the time of the day, non-existent public transport to those jobs. We are now in a society that people are being forced to drive to work, and if you can't drive or can't afford a car, then I'm not sure what people are meant to do. This real dispute is costing jobs, and this devolved government needs to act. And how ironic that we now have Greens in government at a time when real fares are increasing and services are being slashed. No wonder the Green MSPs don't want to comment on the mess that they are complicit in. And of course, in my area, we have the oil and gas industry, once seen as the cornerstone of the independence argument, but now being thrown under the bus by this SNP Green coalition. How will this attitude help those communities in the northeast of Scotland who are seeing their opportunities being swept away by the hostility demonstrated by this devolved government? So maybe the Minister will focus on this list of economic failures when he's summing up. Because this list is damaging our communities, but no doubt this will be glossed over as they try and congratulate themselves. They need to get their heads out of the sand and see the damage they are making to the economy as a whole. Beside an officer, the principles of community wealth building have the potential, potential to be transformational for many communities up and down the country. It's strange, however, that the government motion has no mention of a huge element, elephant in the room, and that is funding of local government. Mm -hmm. The briefing note from the Improvement Service states that local government have a huge role to play as an anchor institution themselves, as a strategic partner of other anchor institutions who may already be a part of local community planning structures, as a partner of Scottish Government developing policies and enabling measures. So, as we can see, local authorities have a huge role to play when it comes to economic growth and community wealth building. But they are the ones closest to our communities, and they are the ones who understand the local needs best of all. And this year's local government had a real terms cut of £251 million to its core budget. And, of course, economic development is not a statutory service for, for councils. So, as the statutory services are protected, it is vital functions like economic development that have to shoulder the bulk of the cuts. But this seems to be the way of this centralised and devolved government, short-sightedness that will have a detrimental effect on our, all our communities and will have a negative impact on our long-term economic prosperity. The Scottish Government talk about partnership with local government, but it's not a partnership, it's a dictatorship. Of course. 
I welcome the member taking an intervention. In my area um, of Carrick, Cumnock and, and Gin Valley, you will recognise that Ayrshire was definitely not afforded a just transition over the years. Um, would the member welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has committed £3 million as part of the Ayrshire growth deal to a uh, community wealth building um, fund um, in that area that's actually going to build on the work that's been done? If you look at East Ayrshire Council, over a decade they have actually um, produced uh, put all of their money into making sure that local producers are supported in terms of the procurement for school meals. Nicholas Lumsden. I absolutely agree. And that's one of the reasons why local government needs to be funded correctly. Um, without that funding, then it's harder for, for local government to play their, uh, their, the vital role that they can, they can play. And the devolved government dictate to local authorities what they want and local government just to have to fall in line. And this is why the Scottish Government are so against the levelling up funds. These funds allow local government to bid in directly without the controlling, centralising hand of the Scottish Government. Our citizens don't care where the money is coming from Absolutely. to provide investment and jobs into our communities. They just want the investment to happen. And as we've seen the truly ambitious plans and historic funding from the UK Government throughout the pandemic, but more importantly, as we move from our response into recovery, the importance of ensuring communities can rebuild following the economic and social devastation left behind by the pandemic is vital. This investment from the UK Government is levelling up communities right across the whole of the UK, as set out in the £4.8 billion levelling up fund. While the focus on this additional investment has been strategically significant projects, the UK Government has rightly recognised that more targeted funding that empowers local communities is also required. And the Community Ownership Fund, unveiled by the UK Government, provides an additional £150 million for communities across the UK, allowing them to own and manage community assets that face risk of closure. This investment will place significant decision-making powers at the very heart of our communities. In summary, President Officer, we are not miles apart on this vital issue today. Indeed, as I acknowledged in my opening remarks, we are agreed on the ambitions of securing long-term economic security and prosperity across our communities. We agreed that we want to implement policies that improve outcomes for individuals and families. But where we seem to disagree with the government is we want the Scottish Government and the UK Government to work collaboratively, collaboratively and constructively in achieving these results. Presiding officer, we all know that the SNP like nothing better than spin and grievance, but they cannot cover up the economic incompetence and recklessness that they have demonstrated. All our indicators are showing that we are falling behind the rest of the UK, but this devolved government tries to take no responsibility. We have seen them pass the buck so many times, often to local government. Yeah. We have to recognise that local government have a huge role to play in this agenda, and to play a full role in this local government need to be funded correctly. The way this devolved government treats our local government partners is a disgrace. Let's get behind our local government colleagues and give them the tools and the autonomy that they require to do their jobs. This will benefit our communities right across Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Daniel Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 4580.1 up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think if we're being frank and honest, if we went round the room and asked everyone to say what they meant by community wealth building, I think we'd probably find a lot of very different answers. I think if we went outside this room to the street, I think we might find people didn't know what we were talking about at all. And I think perhaps the biggest challenge is to establish that consensus and that common understanding, because without that, we certainly can't make community wealth building successful. And, but let's be clear. In the coming years, we face huge economic challenges. We still don't understand the full costs of COVID, let alone have begun to address recovery. We're in the midst of a cost of living emergency, with many Scots facing spiralling costs for both their heating, travel and to feed themselves. And before these new unexpected challenges, we have the, the challenge of meeting our climate change targets, which create an imperative to overhaul our economy. And that need is urgent. And fr frankly, I am not clear that either the investment nor the plans are in place to meet our 2030 targets. So we need big ideas. And community wealth building could be one of those big ideas, because let's be clear, Beyond these challenges I've set out, there are communities up and down Scotland that have never recovered from the loss of once proud industries such as steel, shipbuilding, mining and manufacturing. And so we need answers that can address both the more recent issues but also those enduring ones.
that we know only too well in Scotland. We need big and bold ideas to rebuild and remake our economy. So community wealth building can and should be at the heart of, that, of this change. Uh, but that's also why we need greater clarity from the Scottish Government, both in terms of what its intentions are, but also the resources that it will be, bring to bear. Because as I mentioned in my intervention, there were seven mentions in the National uh, Transformation, Economic Transformation Plan, but very little clarity about what is meant. And I think that is what we need if we are going to make progress. And when I was listening carefully to the Minister's speech, we didn't hear any uh, detail about how community wealth building will uh, proceed, or what uh, it means in a Scottish context as opposed to those broader examples, and indeed what the first steps will truly be beyond the discussion. I'd be very grateful for, for more detail. Um, Minister. I'm, I'm very grateful to Mr Johnston um, for, for giving way. I think it, the key approach is to recognise that this is bottom-up, it is local communities are the driver, local um, authorities are clearly a key anchor institution, but so are health boards, FE and HE. Now we have the established five pillar model, we have the work that is going on in Ayrshire, starting in North Ayrshire now involving all the local authorities there, plus the health board, the TSI and the college as well. We have the pilot areas, we have other local authorities pursuing their own areas. The action we are taking is in the short term is to support local authorities to develop, all local authorities to develop community wealth building action plans. They are understandably focusing on different pillars in different areas, but from that learning and through consultation, the objective will be that the legislation that we introduce in Parliament later in this session will seek to remove barriers and impediments that those on the front line have themselves identified and to consolidate gains. So I hope that helps to clarify some of the points, but the key aspect of the model is the five-pillar model that has been in place in North Ayrshire and the wider Ayrshire region for some time now. Daniel Johnson. Great. I'm grateful for that lengthy uh, intervention. It does provide some clarity, but I think we need to go uh, further. I think if we look at, at both the examples, both here in Scotland and North Ayrshire and elsewhere, I think a firm commitment that actually needs investment as well as intent. I think it goes more beyond simply removing barriers, but actually also looks at changing the institutional frameworks. Because uh, community wealth building uh, done properly does have the capacity to change, but it, but, it, but it has to have that focus. And we have good, good examples, even closer to home, that perhaps we don't uh, consider as community wealth building currently, such as the Edinburgh Solar Cooperative, even Lothian Buses, a great example of municipal uh, ownership. So we must learn the lessons, both recent and in the past. And I would just take small uh, issue with saying it, that community wealth building is a brand new concept, because I firmly believe that the uh, values at the heart of this, of ensuring that assets and economic means uh, serve and are accountable to those who depend upon them, is absolutely vital. Those are enduring labour values, ensuring that the means of production are as widely held as possible for the benefit of the many, not the few. So we will support the government uh, motion tonight, but our amendment, is, as, and I'll move the amendment in my name, seeks to ensure that it has uh, meaning and purpose. We will not be supporting the Conservative amendment, however, because for two reasons. First of all, I think its focus on local authority uh, 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 funding is uh, somewhat dangerous. This cannot be viewed as a substitute for local authority funding. It, is actually, it must uh, be a, 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 a additional to it. And what's more, I do not think that the levelling up funding, which is a poor substitute for the funding that are replacement, it is really something worth uh, supporting at all. And ultimately, it does ring somewhat hollow to hear arguments about local authority funding from a party who have cut funding to local authorities by half in England. But we, we must uh, go further. So if, uh, we have a cluttered landscape of agencies and disconnected initiatives when it comes to regional economic development. And to be truly successful, it must be embedded at that scale. At the moment, city regional deals are have little accountability and little joined up action with local authorities uh, that, that are with them. And so we, if we are going to be uh, successful, we must have that regional lens because Scotland's regional economic inequalities are gross and unjust. And at just a short distance of 30 miles between Dundee and Edinburgh, we see huge inequalities, as much as 30% in terms of the hourly output per worker. That may be a narrow, cold economic uh, 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 measure, 
but it results in real differences in wages, life opportunities and the ability of people to uh, uh, feed themselves and their families. But going further, we must also look towards infrastructure and transport. And I'm disappointed in some ways that the Liberal Democrat amendment was not taken, because ultimately we can do all of these things. We can create these jobs, but if people do not have the ability to travel to those jobs that have been created, they will serve little point at all. Infrastructure and transport are absolutely key, and I believe this is a point that my colleague Polly McNeill will elaborate on further, because the track record uh, from the current Scottish Government is not a good one. We see a uh, current public transport crisis and meltdown because of their failure to plan, their failure to invest, and it's not just about the two ferries they can't build, it's that many other ferries they should have been, been building over the last decade, which quite frankly they failed to do so. So in uh, summary, uh, presiding officer, we are a welcoming, cautiously welcoming of the government's enthusiasm for community wealth building, but there has to be a huge amount more detail. There must be commitment to both uh, uh, resource, but also long-term commitment, uh, rather than this being just a, another fad, another tick box exercise. But ultimately, we must embed community wealth building at local, regional and national levels, because quite simply, community wealth building is not ambitious enough. We need to have ambition for national wealth building. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll call on Willie Reddy. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm trying not to be grumpy. But SNP ministers, I have to say, they do love these kind of debates. They craftily entice us to daydream about the future, to think big, out of the box, look at the stars, think about other things other than really what's going on in our country right now, all in a desperate attempt to distract us. But today we get the promise of pilots, of action plans, and now all we need, I think, is a working group uh, and another consultation, and we'll have the full set. But if you look at the reality, take Loch Aber. We were promised... Yes, I'll take an intervention. Minister. Just in case Mr Rennie misheard me, it's not promises of pilots. These pilots are already in existence. This is happening. It's been happening for years. £3 million of investment into Ayrshire for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. So I just want to reassure the member and disabuse him of any notion that this is simply a, a mission statement or rhetoric. It's happening, it's happening on the ground and we're deepening and accelerating that work. Willie Rennie. Well, that excites me greatly. Um, I am ecstatic that he's now got these pilots actually working. What about doing stuff? What about doing stuff up in Loch Aber? We were promised 2,000 jobs on the back of the £586 million financial guarantee provided to GFG Alliance for the aluminium smelter. What have we got? A handful of jobs. Nowhere near the 2,000 that were promised. Also, the First Minister went to Fort William and she promised there would be a community land transaction, exactly what the Minister was talking about today. And it's known as the Jamhara, Jahama, Highland Estate, and it was supposed to be to, de to benefit the people who live on or near the estate. I'll tell you what we've got so far is the transfer of a quarter of an acre car park. A quarter of an acre car park. That's not community wealth building. Take offshore renewables. The Scottish Government have sold Scotland on the cheap. The value of the successful bids in Scotland are far below what we're managing to get elsewhere in the United Kingdom. In this country, £100,000 per square kilometre. Round four in England and Wales achieved £879 million, which is £361,000 per square kilometre. Just let me finish this point. That's almost four times as much as what we've got here sold off on the cheap and will take an intervention. Daniel Johnson. I thank Willie Waring for, for, for taking the intervention. My understanding is that the value is just, uh, we sold off for just 5% of the total revenues that we generated. And would you agree with me that we've had little more than platitudes in terms of securing uh, supply chains? Isn't that a failure of national wealth building right there? Willie Waring. Absolutely. And what's worse is that they've lumped all the contracts together in a massive big licence round. And what does that do? It means the work's going to go abroad because we're not going to be able to ramp up the capacity or the workforce 
to be able to meet that demand. There's going to be a massive glut of work all at the same time. That's hardly community wealth building. We can't even build the 54 jackets for the NNG wind farm of the fourth. We're not even managing to do that. We're getting eight jackets. You know what's even worse? As well as those jackets getting shipped in from the other side of the planet, we're actually having to ship in workers from Portugal to build those eight jackets here in Fife. That's a disgrace, and it's not community wealth building. Well, workers in Methyl and Leven are paying for these wind farms to be built through their electricity bills. The work's getting shipped in from abroad, and so are the workers. That's not community wealth building. Look at what Reform Scotland said this week about the big grand promise for it felt like decades of the Scottish National Investment Bank. He says, this Ross Brown from St Andrews University, he says the government's going to have to make up its mind whether it's a green infrastructure development bank or whether it's going to be investing in communities and small businesses in communities. The two are very different objectives and using the same instrument to achieve both is at best ill-advised and at worst foolhardy. That's not investing in our communities and it's certainly not community wealth building. And I tell you also what's not community wealth building is depriving our island communities of the first chance of a decent summer tourism season because of the calamity of the ferry services. There will be bookings that are cancelled because people can't be sure to get out to our islands. Just when they wanted some kind of opportunity to build some wealth in their community, it's snatched away from them by this incompetent government who can't build two ferries. Can't build two ferries and as a result, people are losing out in the islands. And then if you look at the rail services across Scotland, 700 rail services cancelled by this government within weeks of taking control of the train service. Communities right across Scotland will have community wealth building opportunities snatched away from them because this government can't even run a train service. Now this all sounds negative, but this is the reality for people in our communities. And while we have these lofty debates and look to the stars about community wealth building with a great grand plan and wonderful pilots, people are suffering. And this parliament needs to keep its feet on the ground and understand what's happening in our communities. Because if it doesn't, it will quickly get out of touch. And I'm afraid this government is already out of touch if it thinks this debate is a substitute for the delivery of services in our communities. So let's get real. Let's have a proper debate about real things. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I call Fiona Hislop to be followed by Brian Whittle. Presiding officer, I will speak to the government's motion on uh, community wealth building, uh, which is very real for many people who will be absolutely insulted by what we've just heard there from uh, Mr Rennie. Community wealth building is an idea whose time has come as part of developing a new economic growth model of wellbeing where we take a more rounded approach to what success looks like. It embraces the strength, the ingenuity, the enterprise and creativity of local people to shape and develop locally sustainable economies and must be a way forward. The SNP Government has been supporting the development of that wellbeing approach as founding members of the wellbeing economy governments and by piloting those six community wealth building projects. And we must rethink our models of growth and delivery. The pandemic and the recognition of the role local people play in our communities, the importance of local secure supply chains, economic growth which is raising and spending wealth locally, all provides further impetus to the agenda. The APSI report into new entrepreneurial municipalism is a real challenge and an opportunity for local councils and sits well with community wealth building and the pioneering creative and community-led approach of SNP-run East Ayrshire Council is an example of this. And the government motion agrees we need shorter supply chains supporting net zero ambitions. The West Lothian, uh, West Lothian Council, the Scottish Government's Place-Based Investment Fund, 
has supported Westlothian College to develop a local skills supply chain for net zero with a passive house and a retrofit house to help in the expansion of locally sourced, trained, skilled workers in this field with almost half a million pounds to construct that training centre. The benefits of sustainability and resilience are critical to this agenda, and if the Minister has not done so, I suggest that he and other MSPs read the Economy Committee's report into sustainability and reliance of supply chains and our commitments on measuring carbon miles in public procurement. Anchor public institutions can support sustainable and resilient local sources of wealth, from food to, importantly, energy, and it is the asset ownership of community-focused buildings and energy sources which already are and can lend themselves to further community wealth-building development. And the Minister has invited us to consider what elements we can consider in developing policy and law. My first advice is only legislate if you need to. Uh, smart, nimble and enthusiastic policy making by inspired local leadership can often produce quicker, faster results. On procurement, this is an area where legislation may be required to give confidence to local partners to procure locally, where value for money has often led to now globally vulnerable supply chain choices not well suited to community wealth building. And we need lead um, I'm, I'm going to proceed. I want to address the motion, unlike the uh, main spokesperson for the Conservative. We need leadership uh, with partnership. The community wealth building model involves local authorities and their community planning partners ensuring collective investment decisions, focusing on how local economies can be helped to grow and flourish. But that means genuine partnership and not a centralised council command and control model repackaged, or indeed from government. It has to be local and community. And we have to share risk equitably. And we need to think differently about risk. Martin Avila, the Chief Executive of Community Enterprise Scotland, told the Economy Committee last week, some of the previous Scottish Government's rental guarantee schemes were there for developers to be able to take risks in order to develop new housing stock. But they were not necessarily open to community owners. We were therefore telling the private sector that its risk could be underwritten by the state because the rental income guarantee scheme guaranteed it would receive an income, but that was not open to socially focused organisations. Often as a state, he went on to say, we say that we understand that private enterprise is risky, so we will incentivise and de-risk it, and we will get to privatise the value, they will get to privatise the value that is captured. However, when it comes to community organisations that want to socialise the economic value that they create, we say that we are not really sure that they can carry their plan out without failing. So we have to end that false equivalence, end quote. On funding, we warned, um, be warned of place funding spread thinly across individual projects councils already wanted to support rather than generate growth and leverage partners and private funding and build a local customer base. And challenges, anchor projects in district heating and energy, including solar generation and electric vehicle charging, are being developed and local energy companies are an example of asset building as the way forward. But that comes back to what is statutory and what is not and what the capacity and capability of local councils are to resource them with people and expertise. And town centres matter, but each and every one is different. And the leadership and skills may be found in different places. If the government, as explicitly said, as explicitly said, business improvement districts need to be consulted on place-based funding and there's evidence that they haven't been, then he should be concerned. So, presiding officer, I have said in this chamber when we discussed our immediate recovery from the early part of the pandemic in the summer of 2020, that we needed a revolution in our economic thinking, not just evolution. And I think community wealth building as part of the wellbeing economy drive is a revolution, which is happening in plain sight, but not often heralded as such. So I hope this debate can act as a clarion call to herald in this new era for Scotland. The difference is this government and this party trust the people of Scotland, we trust our communities, we put faith in them and we respect them by driving forward this agenda which respects, Mr Rennie, the communities of our country. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to get the opportunity to speak in today's debate. And as the Chamber is aware, it's my belief and the belief of my party that the development of community is essential for the prosperity of Scotland. 
And we can call it community wealth building, but I think it's important to define what we mean by that. To me, it's creating an environment where people want to live, work and play, where the essence of community and community interaction, that intangible feeling of belonging can grow. And in doing so, a community well-being and therefore wealth is developed. In recent decades, as I've said many times, it is my belief that the heart of so many communities has been ripped out as a policy of centralisation from the Scottish Government has been pursued to the detriment of said communities. What we are talking about here is the ability of communities to come together in a shared interest. And I have said before, this can be sport, art, music, drama. I, I think uh, I have mentioned it so many times, and I think it has been paid lip service. It is the ability for communities to all turn up to watch their children participate on a Saturday morning, for parents and friends to be part of that, be that in an official capacity or otherwise. However, the presiding officer, community assets have been systematically ripped out and allowed to fall into disrepair. The ability of communities to engage has been eroded. Too often these days, for people to participate in any kind of activity, they must come home from work or school and then go somewhere else. This, of course, impacts the less well-off to a much greater degree. Presenting officer, we must look to schools and their facilities much more these days to become the community hub, open up the school estate and use it for community activity. That, surely, is more important now than ever. Open spaces to play and learn should all be in our communities. Now, that is something that my colleague Led Smith has long championed. These opportunities are becoming rarer and rarer. Connecting communities is another issue that has been allowed to drift, which has such an impact on a community's ability to grow and prosper. Ever since I have entered this place, we in these benches have been crying out for an investment in transport infrastructure, especially in the South West, in my case. Speak to the communities along the A77 and the A75, not to mention the 76, the 72, the 71, the 70, and ask how easy it is to get to work and to access basic service amenities. How on earth do the Scottish Government expect to be taking seriously discussing community wealth building when huge swathes of the country remain ignored with infrastructure that has not been invested in for decades? Yet, Presiding Officer, we have a Scottish Government so insular that they will not engage with the UK Government on their desire for extra investment into our community infrastructure, a point that was made by my colleague Doug, uh, Douglas Lumsden. Then there is the, trail the, the train link in the South West which I was going to suggest needs significant investment to bring it up to the standard required, along with investment in train services generally, opening up stations and rail links, encouraging public transport usage. But that would seem a bit of a mute point at the moment, given there are so few trains now running. There are two trains a day from Stranraer to Glasgow, and in some places the last trains to busy Ayrshire stations will be cut by hours, with some final journeys leaving Glasgow as early as 20 past six. Instead of community wealth building, communities are being cut off. So when the Scottish Government had the audacity to mention net zero in its motion, we are left with wondering how far out of touch from communities they really are. The only way for communities to reach out now is by car, and it won't be electric cars, as rural communities are the very last places to get electric charging points. I also want to mention public procurement. I recognise that was an element in, in Daniel Johnson's motion, and I agree with him uh, completely. Invest monies in local economy, whatever possible. Surely that goes without saying. But again, uh, presenting officer, not for this government. For as long as I have been in this parliament, we have been debating with, encouraging, cajoling in the Scottish Government to revise public procurement policy, but to no avail. Specifically in public food procurement, we must, that surely must be an easy win. Support our local food producers, our rural economy and the health of our children in schools, patients in hospitals and all of public office staff. And I listened to Fiona Hislop mention East Ayrshire, and that, to me, is the frustration, because East Ayrshire Council have shown us for years that this can be done and the way to do it, and yet the rest of the country is not following suit. What a frustration! But no, here we are still importing the majority of our food, often at the standards far lower than that of local produce. I will take an invention. Jim Fairley. Thank you very much for taking the intervention. Uh, does the member not recognise that that is exactly what the Good Food Nation Bill is all about? And that already we have 90 per cent of the beef or the, or the red meat that is going into schools is already from Scottish food suppliers? Brian Whittle. I thank Jim Fairley for that intervention. What I would, where I would disagree with him, that is what the Good Food Nation should be about. 
it is an absolute shell. And the fact of the matter, if you look at the Excel public procurement policy, it is something like 16 per cent of the food uh, that we use in schools comes from Scotland. And I think that is an absolute shame, shame on the Scottish Government. Presenting officer, community wealth building is about so much more than pounds and pence. It is about engendering a sense of community pride, creating that environment where people want to live, work and play, of allowing communities the opportunity to come together as a community and connecting them to other like-minded communities. Do that and the financial wealth will follow. Sadly, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has shown it is unable to grasp the meaning of community wealth building. Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, President Officer. Community wealth building will help build resilience in local economies to create a fairer and more secure economic future. It will also support the development of land for community benefit and, as has been said, it relies on five pillars. Progressive procurement, and I will speak a bit, a bit about that later. Shared ownership of the local economy, socially just use of land and property, making financial power work for local places and fair employment and just labour markets. In terms of the last point, the Scottish Government's fair work first approach is very welcome and there are many real living wage accredited employers across the country. Scotland has been described as a global leader in the community wealth building movement. I am biased, President Officer, but I believe East Kilbride is doing well too. We have good foundations in place to push forward and make the most of new opportunities, including the many enterprises that follow the community wealth building pillars. For example, East Kilbride Credit Union offers a very ethical and safe way to save and they exist to serve the local community. We have fantastic social enterprises as well, such as the furnishing service led by Randall Wilson. They have won many awards from Scotland Excel over the years, have created many employment opportunities for young and disabled people, and have diverted more than 1,000 tonnes of product from landfill. There are many other companies in the town who are committed to employee wellbeing and fair employment practices. And there are also several employee-owned businesses, including Novograph, Grossart Associates and Klansman Dynamics. We are also lucky to have some excellent public spaces, such as Langlands Moss, Calder Glen Country Park and the James Hamilton Heritage Lock in East Kilbride, as well as the Glen Esk Pocket Park in St Leonard's and the newly designated Local Nature Reserve in Mossnook. Between them, these areas offer amazing benefits to locals, including great walking routes, bike trails, water sports, outdoor classrooms, sports facilities and cafes. And I understand that a variety of flora and fauna enjoys those areas too. There are many community groups helping to protect and enhance these spaces, including the Friends of Langlands Moss and the East Kilbride Development Trust. As well as community-minded organisations like them, the role of the public sector will be crucial going forward. From local authorities to the NHS, the large budgets available to the public sector could be used to unlock wider benefits. This includes pension funds. When I sat on the pension board for the Strathclyde Pension Fund, we were very keen working alongside trade unions to make sure that the direct investment portfolio was used at a local level to boost local economies and support ethical businesses. So we followed many of the principles of community wealth building. Another way these public sector organisations can affect change is through procurement. I believe there is a big opportunity by applying progressive procurement practices to create local well-paid jobs and maximise community benefit. Supply chain visibility is an important part of this. When large companies win contracts, we should be able to see where their subcontracting goes. These processes should be open and transparent so that we can easily identify the community benefit of big contracts. I have spoken before about the Supplier Development Programme. They do great work with small businesses to help them understand procurement processes and highlight the opportunities available in subcontracting. 
This shortening of the supply chain by using local enterprises delivers a clear benefit in local communities through employment opportunities and business growth. But it also supports us in terms of reaching our climate targets by reducing the carbon footprint of our products. The proposed Community Wealth Building Bill could help here by developing procurement practices to support local economies, including small businesses, and encouraging school canteens. No, I'd like to make progress. Thanks. And encouraging school canteens and hospitals to use more locally produced food. In conclusion, presiding officer, community wealth building offers us great opportunities to improve our local communities, support fair employment, take a place-based approach to the economy, and to deliver on our climate targets. One of the big things for me is the use of progressive procurement in the public sector, so that big contracts support local and ethical businesses and create a, a protect good quality jobs. If we take anything from the experience of the pandemic, it should be the belief that we could effect real change, that we should protect and enhance our local spaces, and that we must build a fairer and more secure economic future. By putting the emphasis on local, community wealth building is key to that. Thank you. Thank you. I call Richard Leonard to be followed by Alistair Allen. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There is a climate emergency. People are working for the economy, but the economy is not working for the people. We've got massive inequalities of income, of wealth, of power that are growing ever wider. In one of the wealthiest nations in the history of the world, life expectancy is not going up, it's going down. One in four of all children in Scotland are living in grinding poverty. And yet two out of three of those children are being brought up in households where at least one adult is in work. What a shocking indictment of our low pay economy. What a shocking indictment of capitalism. And what a shocking indictment of the SNP Green Government Minister for Just Transition, Employment and Fair Work, who on £98,000 a year takes to the BBC at the weekend to lecture working people of Scotland to be sensible and to exercise pay restraint. Shame on you. I've long argued that building an economic strategy around foreign direct investment is a catastrophic error. According to the Scottish Government's own latest annual business statistics, 82% of all large businesses in Scotland accounting for 65% of employment and three quarters of all turnover now have their ultimate base, their headquarters, their ownership outside Scotland. This is not a mark of economic strength, but a sign of powerless economic weakness. We have a branch plant economy with far too much of the wealth that is generated, extracted and then exported. And this is precisely why a community wealth building approach to economic development is now more critical than ever. It's why it needs to move from the fringe to the mainstream. It is not a refinement, as the Minister said, we need. It is a revolution. And why simply trying to create a pro-growth, pro-business, post-Brexit environment is to fundamentally misunderstand the, both the scale of the challenge we face and the direction the economy now needs to go in. Let me be as plain to government ministers as I can be. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Jim Fairley. I'm sorry, confused by what you just said. Are you actually against business? <laughs> Richard Leonard. No, I'm in favour of business building from the bottom up. The problem with your party's government policy is that for too long it's been reliant on foreign direct investment as the only engine of growth. We should be looking to the people, we should be looking to local businesses, and we should be looking to the wealth that's in our communities as the basis for economic development. Because traditional solutions will not work. We need an economic plan, a jobs first industrial strategy, which is investment led, people centered, net zero, and manufacturing driven. And we need a new economic strategy of state intervention to secure 
popular control rather than simply popular intervention to secure state control. Let me give a practical example of community wealth building. For nearly two decades, we've had a Land Reform Act giving communities a statutory right to buy the land they live on. So the time is long overdue for an Industrial Reform Act giving working people a statutory right to buy the business, the enterprise that they work in. Because why shouldn't the people who create the wealth own the wealth that they create? And it's my intention to bring a bill to Parliament which will seek to deliver this in due course. Because I firmly believe that the time has come where we need to be radical in our thinking, transformative in our vision and resolute in our action. And that means using the financial firepower that we've already got, like our pension funds. The Strathclyde Local Government Pension Fund is the second biggest local government fund in the UK, with assets worth £26 billion. And yet it could undertake so much more primary investment activity locally. Instead of relying so much on secondary investment activity, the buying and selling of stocks and shares which benefit economies on the other side of the world. And we should use the financial firepower of public procurement, where we spend £13 billion a year in Scotland. But we know, again, that far too much of it ends up in the hands of large global corporations, too many of them registered in tax havens. So we need a new path based on the principles of economic, social and environmental justice, because we know and the people we represent know that the rigged way our economy is run and the unequal share out of the fruits of their labour is not the natural order. We know and they know that there is an alternative way of organising the economic system. And we have caught a glimpse of the possibilities of community wealth building in North Asia. We know what has worked in Preston. We have seen the benefits internationally in Cleveland, Ohio. So let's make community and worker ownership, climate and social justice, equality and democracy, decentralisation and diversity central to the kind of economy that we want to build after the pandemic so that every job is a green job. The whole economy is a social economy. And let's not just merely deba debate it. Let's go out there and do it. Thank you. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This afternoon's debate is a very timely one for many decades. Wage stagnation, low productivity sometimes, and huge wealth inequalities have often seemed like entrenched features of the Scottish economy. And as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, there has never been a more important time to examine our approaches to local economic development. But contrary to some of what we've heard this afternoon, uh, uh, what's been outlined by the Minister uh, around community wealth building is a people-centred approach to local economic development, which redirects wealth back into the local economy and places control and benefits into the hands of local people. The Scottish Government is working with five areas, including uh, my constituency of Nihilin and Anir, to produce bespoke community wealth building action plans. Community wealth building is underpinned by five central principles – progressive procurement, fair employment and just labour markets shared ownership of the local economy, socially just use of land and property, and making financial power work for local places. In many ways, it is difficult to think of a part of the country more suited to the ideas behind community wealth building than my own part of the world. The Western Isles has the highest rate of living wage employers anywhere in Scotland. Its strong tradition of crofting encourages durable links between communities and the land. And it is a place which has been a trailblazer for community land ownership, uh, with a significant 70 per cent of people now living on community-owned estates. And community land ownership has to be an essential aspect of uh, any community wealth building strategy that we want to talk about. There are people, uh, perhaps even some members in this place, who would argue that the way in which land is used uh, is far more important than how it is owned. However, community wealth building recognises the intertwined nature of land ownership and land use. Different forms of ownership come with different forms of management, which in turn determine how land is used. And I can think of countless examples in my own constituency which illustrate that. 
If we look at West Harris, the West Harris Trust has done some fantastic work since the community bought the land from the Scottish Government in 2010. At this time, the population of the area was unsustainable, with a very low proportion of residents of working age, and 35 per cent of the housing stock was self-catering cottages or holiday homes. The Trust wanted to attract young families into the area and focused on creating employment and housing prospects for them. Now, while those problems of fragility have certainly not gone away, since 2010, the Trust has created opportunities for small local businesses to flourish, sold housing plots, enabled the construction of new housing units for rented social housing, and as part of a shared equity scheme, created jobs within the Trust itself and a further 20 jobs uh, at the Trust's purpose-built arts, food and entertainment centre. Now, these numbers may sound small, but in a community the size of West Harris, they do have a disproportionate impact. And of course, and as a major employer, it provides a range of opportunities for local suppliers and ensures all income derived from their facilities, crucially, and this is where the relevance is, is reinvested back into the community for local projects. This has had a real impact with a 20 per cent increase in population since the Trust was established. In contrast with this, and this comes back to my point about the relevance to this debate of community uh, ownership uh, uh, of estates, in contrast to West Harris, um, the, another community in my constituency, Great Bernera, faces similar demographic challenges to Harris, and its people have no less of a sense of community and no less a wealth of talent to draw upon. However, unlike West Harris, the island remains in absentee private ownership, despite the best efforts of the Great Bernera Community Development Trust. Well, the community landlord in West Harris is a driver of development. In Bernera, I have heard complaints from constituents there of demands for large sums of money before the landlord will allow legitimate transactions around tenancies to proceed, raising objections as he does to planning permission for new housing and refusing to engage with crofters seeking to exercise their legal right to buy their crofts. Now, local residents say these actions are prohibiting the island's development and hastening its depopulation. The island has already lost its local shop and school in recent years, while the community have been unsuccessfully trying to persuade the absentee landlord to cooperate with their buyout efforts. So, presiding officer, that's why land ownership matters in the context of the debate that we're having today about investing in communities. The best people to decide the future of our communities across Scotland are the people who live in those communities. I will indeed. Finley Carson. I, I thank the member for taking an intervention. What do you say to those communities who have strongly opposed planning applications which have subsequently been overturned by the, the SNP Scottish Government? And we're talking about 400 in the last uh, few years, uh, and that number is increasing year on year. What do you say to these communities which uh, their, their voice is not heard? Alistair Allen. Well, I would have thought that the voices uh, within communities are heard through the planning application process, and the planning application process has always uh, given a role to ministers. But the point I want to end on is that, uh, as an MSP representing part of the Highlands and Islands, I am heartily sick, I must say, of one or two people with little or no connection with the, the, the region who try to impose their notions uh, on communities about what land should be used for with the expected growth of natural capital markets and the increasing number of businesses and organisations perhaps seeking to become green layers, it will be more important than ever for us to do, as the Minister is setting out today, to, to guard against models of ownership that do not have local communities at their heart. Thank you. And I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK is one of the most unequal countries in the world, according to the OECD. Vast amounts of wealth and assets are held by a small number of people. Indeed, the Sunday Times Rich List shows that the number of billionaires in the UK is at an all-time high, 177 billionaires, people who saw their wealth rise by 9.4% over the last year. Scotland's top 10 billionaires had a combined wealth of over £23 billion. At a time when so many people are way beyond facing the choice between heating their homes and eating, they can afford neither, it is clear that our economic system is broken. Current models of economic development have failed to redistribute wealth, to provide adequately for all people in all of our communities. Our economy is far from well. 
So today's debate is welcome and it is important. Community wealth building won't fix all of our economy's ills, but it is an attempt to roll back one of the most damaging Thatcherite initiatives of the 1980s, that of moving public spending from something that should benefit the public to something that benefited the big corporations invited in to tender for public services. Compulsory competitive tendering has resulted in the funneling of money out of our communities. For too long, we've heard that bundling contracts create efficiency, that the cheapest bid is the best, and that the public pound should be used to increase private profits, not public good. Enough. We know that we need to be more resilient that strong, resourceful and innovative communities are better able to organise and work together to look out for each other and improve the, improve the lives of all their members. Community wealth building offers a way to support this work in a meaningful way. And we are not starting from scratch. We can build on the social solidarity that developed in many places during the pandemic and put community organising and wealth building at the heart of our plans for a green recovery. We must do this as we continue to deal with the pandemic and, of course, tackle climate breakdown. We must do it in a way that builds the foundations of a new economy, one focused on community wealth. In other words, we want to re-establish a community-based way of life, one that sees value in and of society, one that increases economic self-reliance and local control over, over, over people's environments and their decision-making structures. One that sees the connections and interdependencies between the economy, our environment and our society. This approach means that people and their labour must matter more than capital. Our local and regional economies must recognise that people matter more than corporate bottom lines. We cannot let the market and capital call all the shots if we want to build community wealth. Shri thriving local and regional economies require local ownership where the control and economic advantages of that ownership are spread more broadly, such as through cooperative, community or employment, employee ownership models. This guards against the extraction of wealth on behalf of those at the top. The Minister earlier highlighted the importance of grassroots engagement and participation to community wealth building. We need active participation in strong and robust democratic structures. Because despite what neoliberalism tells us, Communities are not isolated individuals engaged in civic life only as passive consumers. And localising investment and capital circulation matters too. When goods and services are produced and purchased locally, that money stays in the community longer because local businesses are more likely to spend locally. This translates into greater local prosperity, greater community stability, stability a tighter knit network of local people and businesses all key to building community wealth. Imagine if we used our collective community wealth for good, rather than fueling the casino economy that does little to provide for all. But building community is, much more, uh, is about much more than just having money circulating locally. It's about the power that comes from building lasting relationships of mutual support, Fostering effective collaboration between anchor organisations, local government and neighbourhood residents isn't just a matter of convenience or capacity. It is utterly intrinsic to the project of community wealth building. And place really matters. But placemaking does not happen by accident. Places need coherent strategies to ensure local assets work to build local wealth. And as others have mentioned, they need to be coherent connections to transport and other infrastructure that are vital to community survival. In closing, presiding officer, I'd like to record my thanks to organisations, including Community Land Scotland, the Development Trusts, Associ uh, Trusts Association Scotland, and Community Enterprise in Scotland for highlighting the vital work of anchor organisations. And I'd like to thank them too for highlighting what we can learn from other community-focused legislation this parliament has enacted and for pointing out the need to now make things happen at a timescale that does not lead to drift and disinterest. As Pauline Smith from Development Trusts Association Scotland told the Economy and Fair Work Committee just last week, we are not reinventing the wheel here. Different terminology is used. Development Trusts, Community Enterprise in Scotland and other agencies have supported the, these organisations to create community wealth and make things happen in their communities. To be honest, I think we just need to work together and we all have a part to play. Let's just get on with it. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr Chapman. Uh, I now call on Emma Harper to be followed by Finlay Carson for around six minutes. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak this afternoon. When I looked into the work of the Democracy Collaborative led by Ted Howard, I realised the huge potential of community wealth building. There is no one-size-fits-all approach, but the bottom-up approach centres around democratic ownership of the economy and community self-determination. And, President Officer, I'm saying it isn't just a one-size-fits-all approach, as what happens in the Central Belt and in Glasgow will be different to what happens in rural areas like the southwest of Scotland. Having lived in California for many years, I've witnessed wealth inequalities and the consequences of that. What is outlined by the Democracy Collaborative is what I want to see in Scotland. It's about wealth redistribution and benefiting our communities. It's also in sharp contrast to what the UK Government are doing with their hard-right individualist policies. Poseidon officer, by its fundamental design, today's corporate capitalist system takes wealth that would otherwise reside in local communities and concentrates it at the hands of a small elite. The ONS reported that there are an estimated 27.8 million households in the UK and 263,000 con control 45% of our country's wealth. And in Ted Howard's model, community wealth building proposes an economic model with more local good quality jobs, improved access to public contracts for local businesses, particularly important for our agricultural and forestry community. More land should be placed in community ownership and support being offered to new businesses exploring in employee ownership. CWB supports renewable energy development with the wealth generated being distributed back to the community. For me, this means the potential for the development of renewable offshore energy in the South West, potentially in the Solway Firth. I'd be interested in exploring this potential in the next round of Scotland licences. When I visited Eyemouth Harbour last year, it was evident that millions of pounds in high-value jobs had and will be brought to the community through renewable energy investment. When it comes to how money is spent and services commissioned by our institutions, cost is often dominant. It's the dominant determining factor in who gets a contract. Environmental credentials, social value, decent employment conditions tend to be weaker considerations. We need to see this change. With community wealth building, we can create legal change in our procurement processes, and others have talked about this already. This can ensure that small, local and medium-sized enterprises and employee-owned businesses support local jobs and have a greater tendency to recirculate wealth directly to our communities. For example, it can allow our agricultural community to provide local produce to our schools, hospitals, social care centres, prisons and other institutions, something I have been pursuing locally but have faced local bureaucratic barriers. And I therefore welcome the Government's commitment to reform procurement processes and ask for a commitment that this will be taken forward at pace. Presiding officer, ahead of this debate, I spoke with Rob Davidson, Community Wealth Building Manager with the South Scotland Enterprise Agency. And the Minister has described some of the SOCI work that has already taken place with registered social landlords. SOCI hit the ground running at the beginning of the pandemic, supporting businesses practically and financially for Selkirk to Stranraer to promote community wealth principles. SOCI Yes, I will. Finley Carson. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. Would the member welcome uh, the UK Government's Community Ownership Fund, which has seen £175,000 being spent in New Galloway Town Hall and 300000 towards Wigton Rebuild? Emma Harper. I, I do welcome some of the funding, but what I don't like is the fact that the money is coming to places in areas which are devolved to the Scottish Government. What I would respond to the, the member is, are you happy that uh, this place has been tramped upon in devolved areas by, by the, the UK Government? That's what, I would, that's what I would respond by saying that. Um, SOCI are working with Stranraer Furniture Project, presiding officer, as part of the community reuse shop led by project manager Paul Smith to support this social enterprise to grow and expand. And they are also incorporating fair work practices. And from a phone call this morning, the Stranraer Furniture Project now has 22 employees and it is working to, in, to the wider benefit of the community. And I would encourage members to look at the wide range of activities Paul and his team are undertaking. 
and in Castle Douglas, presiding officer Stuart Ricare, providers of home care with almost 100 employees, are beginning a democracy collaborative model of employee ownership. So it's already happening out there. Members are saying this is looking at the stars, pie in the sky. It's not. It's happening on the ground right now. With SOCI support, Stuart Ricare are encouraging employees to take leadership and ownership roles in the company. One final example of a D&G CWB trailblazer is Jaspi Wilson. They're a forestry equipment manufacturer and distributor in Dalbiti. And Jaspi Wilson have donated a car to the local first responders so that they don't have to use their own car if, if necessary. And they've financed premises for a local playgroup. They've supported the local Birch, Birchvale Players Theatre in their move to new premises. So, and all of these companies demonstrate how community wealth building is already working across the Friesland Galloway. I welcome these examples across the south of Scotland and I would invite the Minister to come and visit any if his diary allows. Poseidon Officer, in closing, community wealth building is a practical, place-based focused model that can play a central role in growing Scotland's wellbeing economy. A community wealth building approach puts an emphasis on local people and on ownership with a view to growing the number of people that have a genuine ownership stake in the economy. I want more people and local communities in Scotland to have a bigger stake in our economy, share the ownership and build resilience to create a fairer and more secure economic future. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Harper, before calling the next speaker, just a, a gentle reminder um, to all members that you should uh, remain in the chamber for at least two speeches after your own. I'm not going to name and shame, but just uh, these reminders, I think, periodically are useful. I now call Finlay Carson to be followed by Pauline McNeill for around six minutes. Mr Carson. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And it goes without saying that anything that helps Scotland's economy has to be warmly welcomed, particularly if support is being provided at a local level. And yes, community wealth building is a step towards achieving this goal. The core principles of community wealth building, including procurement, uh, include procurement whereby people are being encouraged to buy and spend locally in order to support businesses in their area and, importantly, protect and, if possible, create new employment opportunities. Community wealth building can bring positive moves towards improved use of land and assets to ensure our communities and businesses make better use of land and properties to support regeneration opportunities. Then there is plural ownership, where wealth generated in a specific area will remain there to support new and existing businesses, including social and community enterprises, cooperatives and employee ownership. This is particularly important in rural areas, where far too often projects maybe create uh, short-term employment and benefit, but the wealth generated, for example, with wind farms and forestry, soon leaves the region. On this side of the chamber, we welcome schemes supporting community wealth building, many of which are supported through the UK government's local support schemes, such as the Shared Prosperity Fund and Leveling Up Funds. And these schemes provide local communities with a greater say in where funds should be spent and projects that need to be supported. And this is of great importance uh, on local funding compared to the SNP cuts to local budgets um, and, and centralising decisions, um, because it effectively gives local communities their voice back, and rightly so. And the local community needs their voices listened to, because the SNP government is ignoring them by overturning nearly 400 local planning decisions since 2017. I certainly will. Minister. For, for giving way. He's, he raised this point earlier on in a, an intervention around um, the planning appeals process. I, I have to ask him in all sincerity, and this is not a loaded question, I, I, I genuinely want to know, does he think there should be an appeals process within the planning system? Finley Carson. Absolutely do, but the problem is there is a disproportionate number of local, locally made decisions have then been subsequently been overturned by the Scottish Government. 400 since 2017, and more last year than ever before. So increasingly, we are witnessing the SNP government ring-fencing more Scottish Council budgets, more than half a billion pounds now. That's hardly local democracy. Local Council budgets are being continually squeezed. In the case of Dumfries and Galloway, it faces an estimated £12.8 million funding gap for the coming year. So it's little wonder that councils of all political persuasion have welcomed a variety of schemes being introduced by the UK government, such as the levelling up scheme, because it will provide £1.5 billion of support to city and growth deals in every part of this country, including the Borderlands Inclusive Growth Deal, a unique cross-border collaboration which will deliver a multi-million pound investment into Dumfries and Galloway over the next 10 years. And this aims to provide the long-term 
I certainly will. Emma Harper. Does the member uh, not think it's a bit disproportionate when uh, the Scottish Government have given £20 million more for the Borderlands growth deal than the UK Government has invested? Is, do you think that's levelling up, or is that just losing out? Finley Carson, I can give you the time back. Um, I, th I think the member must be confused because uh, the Scottish Government spend on devolved issues and the UK Government uh, spend on resol uh, reserved issues. So that's why there's a difference in the funding gap. I thought you would maybe have known that, Ms Harper. Um, however, it provides £1.5 billion across the country and it aims to improve the long-term prosperity of our communities while enhancing the environment. Aspects of the deal worth £425 million, I've, uh, sorry, I've taken enough interventions, I'm sorry. Uh, the £425 million are projects are still being developed, but, but amongst them, and I'm sure Emma Harper will welcome them, is the Stranraer Marina redevelopment, the redevelopment of the former nuclear power station at Chapel Cross, the creation of the Dairy Nexus by the Scottish Rural University College and the Barony College, which will develop long-term innovative solutions uh, for forage-based dairy farming. Uh, and, and money will also be spent on the, the Seven Stains network of mountain bike trials, trails. In addition, the Borderlands will improve connectivity, deliver skills and innovation that will ultimately support the longer-term resilience of towns and communities in my region. As you can appreciate, there is great excitement surrounding the potential of this growth deal, and rightly so, in an area repeatedly starved of any proper investment. Indeed, it is anticipated the Borderlands will deliver an additional 5,500 jobs and attracting more than 4 million extra tourists, unlocking investment and boosting the, economies, the region's economy by 1.1 billion. Both the UK Community Renewal Fund and the UK Community Ownership Funds are other prime examples of where, uh, that have worked in Dumfries and Galloway. Plans to create a 21st century village, a development that promises to become a world-class visitor attraction in Dumfries, moved to a closer uh, with uh, securing 1.4 uh, million funding. And the project will result in nearly 500 new carbon neutral and age friendly homes being built in the Crichton site. Um, projects New Galloway and Whitthorn have been successful in bidding in the first round of the Community Ownership Fund. I have already said 175 for New Galloway Town Hall and 300,000 towards uh, Whitton, uh, Whitthorn rebuild. Both projects supported uh, supporting the social well-being of the communities which are vital to the fabric of my constituency through protecting facilities that would otherwise have been at risk. Furthermore, it is estimated Dumfries and Gal will receive more than £6.7 million to support a range of projects from supporting adults who lack basic numeracy skills, helping young people into jobs and allowing residents to fulfil their potential. The UK and the Scottish Government are working together on these projects, and the Ayrshire the Growth Deal both the Scottish and uh, the UK government have contributed uh, equally in £103 million, uh, with, uh, we've heard already, uh, £3 million pounds going to implement uh, community wealth building. But sadly, that cooperation isn't universal, and it's very disappointing that despite a funding commitment from the UK government as a result of the Union Connectivity Review, that the Scottish government still has failed to meet the UK government to bring much-needed funding to improve the A75, which is absolutely critical in connecting communities and businesses in the south of Scotland. So, Deputy President Officer, in conclusion, positive steps are being taken to drive local and regional economies forward directly, delivering to local communities by the UK Government, and this SNP Government should follow their example. Thank you, Mr Carson. I now call Polly McNeill, who will be followed by the last speaker in the open debate, uh, Audrey Nicholl, for around six minutes. Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, community wealth building risks being a meaningless phrase of the policies linked to it do nothing to alleviate the suffering caused by the cost of living crisis. Currently, the economy simply is not working for a significant number of people. Other members have said this in this debate, that it has to change. I wonder what happened to the rhetoric at the beginning of the pandemic about building back better. We do not hear that much about that now, and I do not believe that we have even started down the path of changing the things that do need to change. Whilst I see the potential of Ted Howard's Cleveland um, model, um, I feel in all honesty to see how Scotland are leading this. And I, mean, I, I, mean, I just make that point, I just I genuinely do not see it. Because one of the sharp reminders um, that, that we need to radically alter the way the economy is structured is that, of course, it is a UK issue that we are 9 per cent of inflation with soaring energy bills. And there does not seem to be an end in sight 
escalating energy prices disproportionately impacting lower income people, as Maggie Chapman and Richard Leonard have talked about. The UK with the highest levels of inflation, the highest energy prices in Europe and other countries in the G7 doing a lot more to protect people from these price increases. So there is a context, there must be a context of this debate and it's right to say so. Any government, whether it's local or national, to me, whilst I do acknowledge that there's pockets of success around the country and I want to acknowledge that, but generally I just see a lot of failures. The fact that the Scottish Government so easily abandoned their plans for public own energy tells me that a community well-building strategy as is completely lacks ambition. And we really haven't heard a good enough rationale for why the alternative plans um, have, haven't really been discussed or well developed. So I think the Scottish Government have got to step up to the plate then if they want to match a well building strategy with the actual problems on the ground that people face today. Because we're heading for another staggering so-called energy price cap this October of 2,800. I know people will be familiar with these figures with 12 million households and fuel poverty across the UK. And the big energy companies that made profits of £1 billion in 2020 are all in denial about these profits being available, even in the short term, to help people who need it. I believe the regulator needs to toughen up and force energy companies to spend some of their profits in directly cutting bills. But I also believe in Scotland we could do a lot more in the context of this debate. Uh, not enough time to talk about it today, but a bigger role for Energy Action Scotland seems to me that there are some devolved aspects we could uh, bring into play here. So the Scottish Government must urgently give support, I believe, for community-owned renewable cooperatives. Uh, theoretically, there is support, so I don't think there's a, a, an, an ideological divide on this point. Um, but it must have this at its very heart. Cooperative models, I believe, are vital. I declare my interest in this as a member of the Cooperative Party. So that communities which host renewable energy pro pro uh, projects must really benefit from those schemes. And this is what the Scottish Cooperative Party are calling for, which I support, to give preferential treatment to genuine community-owned renewables, for example, by giving planning exemptions or tax breaks, seems to me to fit with a wealth building, a community wealth building strategy. You have heard from other members that Preston adopted a community wealth building approach in 2011, and it appears to have been highly successful between 2012 13 and 2016-17, the amount specifically spent and pressed and locally tripled from 38 million to 112 million. So you do see that these policies can have success, and that city also managed to halve its unemployment um, rate. And that's of interest to me, and I know it's of interest to the minister too. And I'm going to talk about Glasgow, and I thank him in advance for a meeting we're going to have on this. And I wanted to use this opportunity to say something about that. This is the kind of renewal that Glasgow needs, because Glasgow, and the motion does say this, uh, city regions are critical for economic development and for building back, if we believe that's what we're doing. So that's why I've been calling for an economic development agency for Glasgow for some time, because I think for Scotland's biggest city, I do not think it will recover out of the many problems it's had without something overarching. I'm sure I don't need to spell out some of Glasgow's problems, uh, and the answers are simply not there at the moment. The announcement on the Clyde Metro is a non-existent transport project that we are not likely to see for 25 years. There has been huge damage done to the taxi trade, which I believe is an integral part of public transport, and no one is listening to taxi drivers. We have lost huge numbers of jobs in hospitality, and government ministers in other departments do not even seem to be interested to engage with Glasgow Airport. And of course, without an airport that has connectivity, a city region cannot be economically viable. So I don't really understand why the Scottish Government are not joining the dots on this. I wanted to conclude, presiding officer, by going back to the question uh, of young people who have been at the sharp end of this pandemic in Glasgow and across the country. It's young adults, probably from the ages of probably 19 and well into 34, that research shows that they had lasting consequences for this group. And, and I would ask the Minister to consider carefully if this is a strategy which is central to the Scottish Government's overarching view of what we do in this Parliament, you really must link this 
very closely to what needs to be done to have young people to get back on track with careers that actually have quality jobs that are protected in those jobs for the work that they do. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, uh, Ms McNeill. We now uh, move to the final speaker in the open debate, Audrey Nicholl, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Audrey Nicholl, for around six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak in support of the uh, Government motion uh, in today's debate. And for anyone here today or watching this debate who is familiar with the north east of Scotland, where my constituency of Aberdeen South and North Kincardine is located, you are very likely to have friends or family members who have a relationship with the oil and gas sector that has been the mainstay of the North East economy for many decades now. And you may also know that while in excess of £300 billion in tax revenue has flowed from the North Sea oil and gas sector to the UK Treasury over its lifetime and counting. The sector has and continues to be a lifeline for the North East and beyond. And while there were unintended consequences of the energy sector, such as high house prices and, of course, recruitment challenges for the likes of nurses, teachers and police officers, the economic benefit has been vast. Today, the sector retains a modified footprint and we await with anticipation the North East playing its part in our just transition that will harness the skills, talent and experience of the oil and gas workforce underpinning our national journey to net zero. And I can hear many people asking, well, what does all this have to do with community wealth building? And in my view, quite a lot. Earlier this week, I listened to a inspiring presentation by Ted Howard, President of the Democracy Collaborative, and like Emma Harper, I was drawn to the philosophy of community wealth building, transforming local and regional economies to deliver a truly well-being economy. And in his presentation, Ted Howard spoke about the challenges of traditional strategies supporting economic development in urban areas that are often simply, as he put it, a sum, zero-sum game, predicated on the concept that markets reign supreme, that rooting jobs locally is irrelevant in a global economy, and that the benefits of economic growth will eventually trickle down. He outlined how we need to move beyond economies that are shaped and driven by the needs of investors, where people where working people are simply considered a cost on a balance sheet towards an option that centres the economy around people and their needs and the communities in which they live, community wealth building. And as the daughter of a local greengrocer, I really didn't need that much persuasion. I would caveat the observations made by Ted Howard related to the US economy. However, they started to resonate with me in the context of the North East. And listening to his perspective, I started to think about the legacy of oil and gas through a different lens, and I realised that as we stand on the brink of a, an energy transition, this is also an opportunity to transform our places in a way that is putting the emphasis on local people and ownership, growing the number of people that have a genuine stake in their local economy. As a constituency MSP, I have spoken to many local organisations, groups and charities that have benefited from corporate support as energy sector businesses fulfilled their social responsibility role in the region, the arts and creative culture, food banks, apprenticeships, all supported by oil and gas, the oil and gas sector, are all contributing to community wealth building. We, we perhaps just didn't call it that, and I, I refer to Daniel Johnson's point uh, that he made on this uh, in his opening remarks. Last year, Aberdeen City benefited from a £1 million award through the Scottish Government Place-Based Investment Fund that supported a range of projects, including in my constituency, the fabulous Greyhope Bay Visitor Centre, 
awarded £50,000, offering the best views and dolphin watching over the city, an off-grid cafe using hybrid energy and circular rainwater treatment technology, and contemporary outdoor creative and edu educational programmes. Inchgarth Community Centre awarded the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service and now benefiting from a £400,000 award to expand the centre, living examples of a community wealth building approach that seeks to help local businesses and communities have a bigger stake and say in how their local economy functions. My constituency also hosts a wide range of small to medium-sized businesses that have been integral, an integral part of the oil and gas supply chain, including a local timber merchant making pallets for the offshore sector and a wholesaler supplying the corporate hospitality sector, to name but two. Both businesses that want to diversify into new markets, thereby supporting local green jobs, retaining wealth in the community, and shortening the supply chain. Presiding officer, the Robert Gordon University report Making the Switch, published just last week, states that the northeast of Scotland, hosting the largest energy, energy skills cluster in the UK, the region has a critical role to play in our energy transition. However, it is vital that our energy transition has at its heart a commitment to energy justice where we seek to restructure our local economies in a way that tackles social, economic and environmental injustices while building wealth in, the com in our communities. Last, week, last year, I spoke in a members' debate about plans to transform a local green space in my constituency into an energy transition zone. Economic growth is essential. However, much of the debate at this point was industry-focused. So there is now a need for a community-orientated perspective where areas are developed in a consensual way, meeting both community and industry needs. So in conclusion, I very much look forward to being part of the delivery of the community wealth building model being developed by the Scottish Government in the North East context, bringing industry, local authorities and others together, thinking out of the box, enabling an approach to energy transition that has truly building community wealth at its heart. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Nicholl. We now move to closing speeches and I call uh, Katie Clark for around six minutes. Ms Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome that the Scottish Government has brought forward this motion today and the wide-ranging debate. As Daniel Johnson said at the beginning of the debate, most people probably don't know what community wealth building is across the country. And I think this debate, hopefully, has spread some information about what it's about. And a number of speakers spoke about the core principles of community wealth building, of progressive procurement, fair employment, shared ownership, the just use of land, and making financial decisions that benefit the local community. This debate is not a new one, in that it's fundamentally about power and wealth and how decisions are made. And as a number of speakers have said, these are not new issues. But for community wealth building to work and to be real, it is going to mean fundamental changes to how government at all level make decisions and policy. And that's one of the reasons that Labour has put in our amendment that we call on the Scottish Government to look at all public procurement policies to ensure that the community wealth building agenda is embedded at every level. Because much of the debate today has been about local initiatives and about local government. But actually, the Scottish Government really needs to look at its own practices as part of this agenda also. And a number of speakers have spoken about that. The challenges we face obviously are not all by any means within the Scottish Government's control. And Pauline McNeill is correct to point out the backdrop of a financial crisis that is going to, help, is going to hurt every community and most individuals in this country. And the cost of living crisis and energy crisis that we face. But as a number of speakers, I'm now going to move on to wealth, but um, 
I'll, I'll take an intervention. Craig Coy. Thank the member for giving way. Will she join me in welcoming the UK Government's levelling up funding, which is delivering £100 million in Paisley, £20 million in Aberdeen and £38 million in Glasgow? And doesn't this show the strength of the Union in action in investing in Scotland's communities? <coughs> Katie Clark. Well, I welcome any investment um, in communities um, that helps put money and power in the hands of ordinary people. And I welcome that from whichever part of government it comes from. So any initiative at any part of government, which is a positive policy, I think all of us um, should welcome. But I don't think this is the place, if you don't mind, for those kind of party political points. And the, the, the point that I would make um, to the, the gentleman um, is that actually many of the criticisms he puts to the Scottish Government are also criticisms that can fairly put um, to the UK Government. Um, but what the, I was going to move on, I'd spoken a bit about the huge challenges our communities face and the challenges of poverty, but as a number of speakers have pointed out, um, the, the pandemic has also been a period where we've seen the wealth of the richest um, increase and a number of speakers, including Mag Maggie Chapman, who spoke about the Sunday Times Rich List have spoken about that. And, of course, the reality is that the inequality in Scotland has increased over the last 10 years. The life expectancy, according to Public Health Scotland, um, between the poorest areas and the richest areas is 26 years for men and 22 years for women. And that is the backdrop um, that we need to discuss this debate in. And I think we are right to say that the community wealth building agenda um, is an agenda that helps to address some of those issues. Because this is a debate about wealth and power and globalisation, which in many ways is the opposite of some of the principles that we've been discussing here today about um, community wealth building, is an agenda which sucks often life out of our economies, importing all our plastic toys from China um, is the complete opposite of community wealth building. So I think a number of speakers, including Fiona Hislop, have been right to point out some of the local initiatives. Audrey Nichols spoke about a number of initiatives um, in her community. We've heard a number of speakers talk about some of the energy initiatives um, that are about building the capacity locally, whether that's municipal ownership and production of energy, whether that is the Edinburgh Solar Co-op, co um, whether that is um, in North Ayrshire, the building of solar farms and wind turbine farms um, that actually are about trying to generate um, power locally and keep wealth local. Because fundamentally what this debate is about um, is about how we organise ourselves um, as an economy. And I think Colette Stevenson was correct, correct to point out in particular the supply chain issues round about transparency in procurement processes and the need for ethical re, re, um, in procurement prioritising local jobs. Um, we need a people-centred approach um, to economic development in Scotland. We need a people-centred approach for local economic development, which redirects wealth back into local economies and places control and benefit in the hands of local people. We need a local first approach to all procurement. That's at a local level, at a Scottish Government level, and I look forward to this debate and to the Minister's response. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Clark. Uh, I now call on Liz Smith uh, to wind up for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, despite a handful of uh, fairly robust exchanges this afternoon, which actually I thought took the SNP by surprise a little bit, I think we can all agree that there are some basic principles which are required to make this policy work well. Firstly, community engagement has to be strong. It has to be based upon an inclusive approach towards the views of local people and upon establishing local mutual trust. Now, both of these matter in tandem, because how often have we seen difficulties encountered by local communities when their views have been undermined? In fact, I think uh, my colleague Finlay Carson pointed out that when uh, developers are um, putting their uh, claim on various community aspects, um, we've often seen that the Scottish Government uh, comes in to support the developer and overturns a lot of community projects. For example, uh, since I think 2017, we know that of 824 planning applications, uh, that the Scottish Government has overturned 383 of them. 
So there is a real, real need to build trust in a level playing field and an appreciation of the vast wealth of local knowledge, which can often go a very long way to ensuring local communities make the very best use of their potential. Secondly, in terms of employment, investment and growth, the community wealth ambitions can complement those of levelling up, not, not substitute. I think uh, Daniel Johnson said it was about substituting. No, it's not. It's about complementing them. And indeed, I would argue that they are the essential components together of exactly the same policy ambitions. And I think it's also important to stress that the general public, especially at a time of very considerable financial stringency, desperately wants to see governments, whether that's Westminster, Holyrood and local government, working together. They are tired of the endless bickering and sniping, and they just want to see that things get done to benefit their local community. And they also want to know uh, that they are getting value for money. And that's a point that Audit Scotland has come back to many times in recent months, because as, as yet, there isn't sufficient transparency and accountability when it comes uh, to the way that the money is being spent and uh, the scrutiny of that money is, of course. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the Smith for giving way. And I totally agree with her point about transparency. But one of my problems is that actually it doesn't feel like there's any money that's been committed to this at all, let alone there being the opportunity for transparency for it. I wonder if you'd agree with that point. Liz Smith. Uh, I, I don't entirely agree with that because I think there is some money. I think um, various members have given examples of where there has been some commitment on money. But you're right in terms of not having enough detail. You mentioned that in your own introduction. We do need much more detail. Um, but the point that Audit Scotland is making persistently is that we don't have enough uh, ability to scrutinise exactly where that money is being spent. And uh, Daniel Johnson sits on the same uh, finance committee that I do. And that's, that's a big point which I think the Scottish Government uh, has to address. And I, I also want to uh, say something about some of the evidence that we've been taking in recent weeks at the finance committee with references to the National Performance Framework. Now, that's very different in scope from the Community Wealth Initiative. But what the National Performance Framework also has at its heart is the improvement of the well-being in our local communities. And herein lies a big challenge. The principles of the framework are all agreed, but the practice of the delivery is a very different matter. And one of the most interesting points that's been mentioned by a lot of stakeholders giving evidence to our committee is this. How can a national framework function effectively at the same time as ensuring there is diversity in local delivery? A dilemma about how we manage state objectives alongside those of local priorities. And on two occasions at the committee, uh, we have been told that this is more about a debate about how far the state should intervene and, and not countermand uh, local individual initiatives. And I think that's a dilemma uh, that really has to be addressed. We have very senior people in local government telling us that there are already some very good lines of communication between different local authorities about sharing good practice across different local communities, but also an understanding of what works well in one community might also not be very successful in another community. And that's, again, something which I think uh, means that we have to have flexibility and diversity uh, within this. And that's a very strong message, um, because if you want to drive success, then you have to promote the devolution of power down to local communities. Get big government out the way, people who are interfering in what local communities want to do and know how to do it best. And we can agree that from the providing a very supportive framework for government <laughs> policy, uh, which supports the creation of jobs, local investment and economic growth. And yes, the infrastructure, which uh, Brian Whittle spoke about so eloquently, because if that infrastructure is not there, if you don't have your sports communities, you don't have your local infrastructure of getting people uh, to specific places, then you can forget your uh, community empowerment. And of course, much of this is based on the increasing willingness of communities uh, to be part of their local communities, to shop locally, to procure basic provisions and also to use local services. And that happened out of necessity during the pandemic. Uh, but we now to, need to ensure that that shift uh, is permanent. Not only is it of considerable benefit to those running local businesses, uh, but also in terms of the demographic movements, because we know uh, at first hand from the Scottish Fiscal Commission statistics, Scotland has major challenges with demographic imbalance and anything we can do to help local communities become much more vibrant uh, and to help our more deprived and remote areas is good news. If local businesses flourish, so too does the local population who will be encouraged uh, to stay. 
Now, yesterday at the Finance Committee, we also took evidence from local government, just as we had done in Glasgow and Dee, respectively, a few weeks ago. And the very strong message which is emanating from local government is the need to let local people decide on their own future, that ring fencing should be used less so that there is more flexibility and more autonomy for local authorities to spend money in line with their own priorities and what they know uh, works best. Douglas Lumsden set out in his introduction why local government funding is absolutely critical to the area of policy making. Because if we constrain that funding, then local government and its autonomy uh, becomes a very serious issue. Now, finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, Fiona Hislop seemed very surprised at uh, Willie Rennie's in in intervention on this uh, issue. And he's right. There are so many important things that we really need to be spending time in this chamber debating on, whether I think it was uh, railways he mentioned, BIFAB uh, and ferries. And I absolutely agree with them. But this is important too. I won't. I think I'm just about to finish on my... Yes, you do need to be winding up. All right. Sorry, Ms Hislop. Um, I, I, we do need to be debating this, but I think it would benefit greatly from some of the uh, greater detail that, we, that the Scottish Government has promised that we will have. We're content to support the motion, uh, but it's contingent on making sure that there is an infrastructure around it to make it work well and so that it can complement so many of the other policies, whether that comes from Westminster or Holyrood or local government. I don't think the public cares about that. They just want it to work. Thank you, Ms Smith. I now call on the Minister to respond to the debate. I would be grateful if you could take us up to just before decision time, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Now, I want to begin by thanking colleagues across the Chamber for their contributions. Um, we have come some way in our journey in community wealth building. We've got a long way to go and we've got an opportunity to really accelerate and intensify that process. So this debate, the first debate on community wealth building we've had in the Scottish Parliament, also offered a, an opportunity for a collective brainstorming session for people to bring forward their ideas about what they would potentially like to see in legislation and about what they think that community wealth building can do for their constituencies and regions, but beyond that, what it can do for Scotland as a whole. Yeah, certainly. It's Katie Clark. Um, he'll be aware that in our amendment, we are calling on the Scottish Government to look at all public procurement policies to ensure that community wealth building is embedded at every level. Is there work going on by the Scottish Government itself to look at its own contracts and its own procurement policies to ensure that this agenda is being fully recognised and embedded? Minister. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to confirm that I will be supporting the Labour amendment at decision time. And I think it was Katie Clark touched upon the fundamental point in this debate. She said that this debate is fundamentally about how we organise our economy. And there were many contributions which turned on you give me one moment, please? There were many contributions which touched on a wide array of different areas around community empowerment, asset transfers, land reform, all related and um, deeply connected to the community wealth building agenda. But fundamentally, this is um, something that is quite radical, indeed as Fiona Hislop characterised it, revolutionary, about how we organise our economy. Moving from a, a failed model of having to redistribute to pre-distribute. Now that's not going to be easy, but that is a prize that is worth pursuing. I'll give way to the member. Craig Hoy. Um, Mr Arthur, forgive me. When you talk about the organisation of the economy, isn't a properly running rail service vital to the proper running of the economy to create employment, wealth and growth? And can he tell the people of Dunbar how that they will uh, build their economy when they have no Scott Rail services? Minister. Look, I recognise that this is a, a hugely significant issue and it has been the subject of much debate and questions in Parliament. I have approximately eight minutes left to go and talk about the community wealth building agenda, and that's what I want to focus my remarks on. Not that I don't recognise the importance of my members' points, but I want to use the opportunity I have afforded to me in this debate to address points that members have raised on community wealth building throughout the debate. Now, the point that Daniel Johnson made around the need for clarity and further information is one I take seriously. Um, I recognise, having been immersed in this agenda, that it can be easy to perhaps assume a level of familiarity and knowledge with the concept. Um, that is currently uh, there's work to be under, undertaken to achieve that. But I think what's also important is that a lot of what constitutes community wealth building is already taking place. I did speak at use a term around a refinement of approach, but that was in recognition of a lot of the work 
that is already underway. And I think it's important that in having engagement and dialogue, we help a lot of businesses, public bodies and first sector organisations to recognise, to self-identify, so to speak, that they are actually already participating within the community wealth building agenda. And there is work that we are doing government in partnership with others to help to articulate more clearly in practical terms what community wealth building means. So again, I take that point very seriously that the uh, member has raised. Um, with, with regards to um, Mr Rennie's comp, uh, contribution, um, not that he doesn't raise a lot of important issues, but I was, I, I was genuinely very disappointed when he uh, suggested that we should be discussing real issues with the implication that this is not a real issue. I actually came across some um, quite inspiring words. Um, Our community focus will decentralise power, build wealth, help communities to be involved in decisions at an early stage and respect the choices they make for their neighbourhoods. We support the people-centred wealth building agenda. That's from page 8 of the Liberal Democrats' manifesto at the local government elections a few weeks ago. I'm sorry, I've, I've listened to enough of Mr Rennie um, this afternoon. So, he had his opportunity and he chose to pursue an agenda that was not really related to the substance of the motion. Um, I thought the contribution from Fiona Hislop was excellent and it provided exactly the kind of constructive challenge that government requires on this agenda. I think that key point about not legislating for the sake of legislating, but to make sure what we put forward is nimble and adds genuine value. And that is why we are taking such a collaborative approach to developing this legislation. We are having the opportunity to have a, to have a debate this afternoon. The Bill Steering Group, which involves a wide range of partners, direct engagement with local authorities and with COSLA, and events through a public consultation as well, all before we introduce a bill into Parliament. So we have an opportunity to identify exactly what the key priorities and issues are that require a legislative remedy. I think there was also a really important point that Fiona Hislop uh, touched on, and that is the need around equity around risk. The risk that we are prepared, a threshold for risk, or tolerance for risk with private enterprise, but less so with community enterprise. And this is something I have been reflecting upon. We perhaps have a culture in Scotland and where we are, can be very quick to jump, to each, uh, jump down each other's throat to go and point out what is perceived as failure. But failure or mistakes is also a learning process. And for many community organisations who have taken on ownership of assets, there has been a learning process. They have had perhaps false starts, difficulties and barriers. But through that process, they have accumulated knowledge, expertise and wisdom, which not only have allowed them to succeed, but ultimately to pass that information on and share it with their peer groups and their communities. And that is something that we have to bear in mind. We have to be tolerant that for an entrepreneurial culture, a community entrepreneurial culture, that it, we have to make sure we're giving people the space to have that vision. Yes, perhaps to make mistakes, but ultimately the support to continue to take things forward. I'll give way to the member. Uh, Douglas Holmston. I thank the Minister for giving way. If if, if, if you're part of a government that really wants to learn from mistakes, why don't we have a, a proper inquiry over the ferry fiasco? Again, Minister. Um, the, the member raises important points, but again, I'm going to focus on the substance of the motion that we are debating here today. I think uh, Alistair Allen spoke very powerfully about the role of land ownership, and that is certainly we have forthcoming legislation. Minister, if you could address your remarks through your microphone, that would be helpful. We do have legislation forthcoming in this session, a new land reform bill, um, so there will be issues that will obviously be relevant to that. But clearly, with land and property being one of the five pillars of the community wealth building model, um, that is something that we have to consider how we can further support. And again, there will be that opportunity through the consultation and engagement for ideas to come forward as, as we consider legislation. Maggie Chapman spoke very powerfully around our broken economic model, as did Richard Leonard, about wealth inequality about the need for community resilience and that the community wealth building model can deliver community resilience. And a number of members touched upon the experience of the pandemic when we saw a level of perhaps solidarity and communitarianism that had perhaps been absent for some time. And I think as we emerge from the pandemic and picking up on the point that Pauline McNeill made, we have to not lose track of that vision that we had at the start of the pandemic, where we committed ourselves to learning from this experience and addressing the fundamental inequalities in society. Community wealth building is not going to be a silver bullet or provide all the answers in itself, but it can play a significant part. And fundamentally, by driving change at the local and regional level, that can have an aggregate effect nationally in transforming the economy of Scotland overall. 
Um, there was in a sort of tangent issues raised around planning, but it's an important, important matter because the point that Liz Smith made about the need for this to be done in partnership with communities, not to communities, but with communities, is important. In the ordinary operation of the planning system, the reality is that the vast number, the vast majority of planning applications are considered at the local level, and those where there is an appeal are considered by independent reporters. Now, if there are ideas for the reform that members want to bring forward, I am happy to listen to them. But where I think the key issue is, it is to have a more, more community engagement earlier on within the planning process in the development of local development plans through using the measures that are in place through local place plans, which regulations were laid for earlier this year. So that is a part of the community wealth building agenda as well. Audrey Nicholl touched very powerfully, as have up the others, on the issue of a just transition. And as the constituency MSP for Renfrewshire South, which uh, includes Linwood, I know very much, as my constituents do, the legacy of an unjust transition. So community wealth building principles are very important because ultimately for a successful just transition, we have to take people with us. And recognising the points where if there is not ownership centred locally, rooted in the community, then it can be very easy for that money to disappear with other incentives with more community control of assets, with more community control of the economy, that becomes rooted. The wealth is circulated it is locally and it is more resilient. So that is intrinsically linked to what we're seeking to do around a just transition. Very briefly. Very, very briefly, Mr Whittle. Very grateful, the Minister, for taking the intervention. We recognise that the increasing ring fencing in council budget is strangling council's ability to make decisions locally. Minister, and if you could wind up now, please. The vast majority of money that local authorities have is under their control, but on the specific issue of ring fencing, that is something that has been considered as part of the resource spending review. There is much that I would like uh, to say in addition to what I have already, but I just want to conclude by thanking members across the Chamber for what has been a very stimulating and informative debate, the first of many we are going to have on community wealth building. And there are clearly members in this place who have a real passion for the model and for the ideals and principles which inform the, the model. So I want to just close by saying that my door is open and I'm very keen to meet and discuss how we can take forward this shared agenda uh, together because I believe it has the, pos the, pos the potential to be absolutely transformative for the people we are elected to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. That concludes the debate on community wealth uh, building, delivering transformation in Scotland's local and regional economies. It's now time to move on to the next and point of order, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy Minister. Um, in questions earlier today uh, to um, Ben McPherson, in his answer, he uh, stated that the facts I had quoted were actually wrong. Um, Deputy President, Officer, the information came from Social Security Scotland report of February this year. Um, how do I correct the record to show that these facts are actually correct? And can you encourage uh, ministers and cabinet secretaries to read reports rather than make up facts? Thank you, Mr Balfour. Um, I think, as you and probably everyone now knows, that is not a point of order. There are ways for members uh, who need to. I wish to correct the record to do so, uh, but I am very grateful. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. It is consideration of business motion. 4614, in the name of George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I am moved. Thank you. Can we have a better quiet there, please? Um, the question is that mo nobody is asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 4614 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Uh, and I ask again George Adam on behalf of the parliamentary bureau to move motions uh, 4615 on appro approval of SSIs and 4616 on parliamentary recess dates. Mr Adam. What you said, President Officer, all moved. Thank you very much. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now seamlessly move. Uh, there are four questions to be put as a result of today's uh, business. The first question is that amendment uh, 4580.3 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, which seeks to amend motion 4580 in the name of Tom Arthur on community wealth building, uh, delivering transformation in Scotland's local and regional economies, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. Um, we will need to move to a, a vote, and I suspend the meeting to allow members uh, to get onto the voting system.